Welcome to First Baptist Church. Let's go ahead and get started with our service this morning by going to the throne of grace and prayer together. Father, we give you thanks and we praise you, Lord, for the shed blood of our Lord and Savior, Christ, Jesus Christ, which has brought us near to you and allows us to approach your throne of grace, Lord, with confidence, not of ourselves, but in Jesus, so that we may receive mercy and grace in our time of need. Lord, let us worship you this morning in spirit and truth. Let us worship you passionately from our hearts. Lord, let us enjoy our time together as First Baptist this morning. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. If you would join me in standing, I'd like to read a passage from Revelation. It says this. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Our Father in heaven is worthy of glory. Is he not worthy of praise? Let's sing together our first song, Crown Him with Many Crowns. time right now, as we do every once in a while, we're going to do a prayer time dedicated toward, towards a specific topic. This morning, I'd like to spend a few moments in prayer with you as our church over the children of our church. And one thing that often gets overlooked is the children's ministry workers at our church. So what we're going to do right now, we're going to take a few moments in prayer over the children and teenagers are part of our church. It's a big responsibility, being a part of a church, being a parent with kids, which all of us share together. So let's bow our heads and pray. 
right now. Father, Lord, we thank you specifically right now. We want to thank you for, Lord, the children, the young people, the teenagers at our church at First Baptist. Lord, we have been blessed with a number of children, a number of teens. Lord, we are thankful for that. Lord, we recognize your word when it says that children are a blessing from you. Father, we want to uplift these children to you in every way. God, we together ask that as the children grow and as they develop, that they would experience and see, Lord, your goodness in their lives every single day. That they would see the beauty in how you have specifically created them as unique, or how you formed them in their mother's wombs, how you uniquely placed them into their families that they have today. Lord, I ask that the children, the young people, the teens of our church would come to faith in Christ and would grow in that faith. But I ask that there would be authentic, lasting heart transformation that takes root and grows and begins to reveal itself in the fruits of the Spirit. Lord, Father, I ask that as these children, as these teenagers grow, Lord, that they would see and experience the importance of a local church in their lives. Lord, we have, they have their parents, their guardians, Lord, care for them and bring them to church. I'm thankful for that, Lord. But I also pray, Lord, that us as the, the rest of the church would embrace our calling to show love and to train and to disciple these, these children, these teens. Lord, this community of believers that we have here, all of us are meant to build each other up, both young and old. Lord, I also want to thank you for each one of our children's ministry volunteers of our church, Lord, who serve so faithfully yet will largely go unseen. So Lord, I uplift them to you, Lord, I ask that, uh, Lord, as, that you would continually give them strength, Lord, creativity, I pray that you would give them adaptability as things come up with children and ministry, that they would be able to convey truth to young hearts and minds. Lord, on the especially, on the especially difficult weeks, Lord, I ask that you would give each of them a lot of grace, Lord, I know that a lot of the children get excited, and I know they're happy to be here, which can cause a lot of extra emotions. So, Lord, I pray that you would give each of them focus, Lord, an understanding about, and continued understanding about how to work with these children and to, at the same time, prioritize your word and teaching. Father, I do not feel like we can uplift the children, the teenagers of our church, Lord, without uplifting their parents, to you as well. But one of the most challenging titles, Lord, that you have given to us as Christians can be parent. So God, I pray that the parents of First Baptist Church, Lord, myself included, that we would lay down at your feet any sense of selfishness or pride that might distract us from fulfilling our calling as parents and leaders in our home. Father, I ask that we would not shy away from our responsibility to model Christ in every aspect of our lives. But I ask that we would be proactive in sharing and teaching the truth of your word with our kids. Lord, when we fail, Lord, let us be a visible representation to our children of genuine repentance and faith in Jesus. Lord, when we are victorious, Lord, let us celebrate with our children where that victory has come from in your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, let us always be looking for gospel conversations and to explain how Jesus changes our lives from the inside out. Lord, we thank you for our children. Let us, as First Baptist, prioritize our children, care for them, reach out to each other, help each other out, serve each other as we serve and love and lead our families and our children. Lord, we thank you for them. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you would, please join me in standing. Let's sing together our next song, Oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. <laughs>
scripture reading this morning. I'll read the first slide. If you would read the second slide along with me, we'll continue through our passage. After this, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, Follow me. And leaving everything, he rose and followed him. This should sound familiar, by the way. And Levi made him a great feast in his house, and there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at table with them. And the Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now, we just went over this a couple weeks ago. Pastor Pete preached on this, but it was a beautiful, beautiful text passage that we get to highlight our God of grace who reaches out to the undesirables, the people that we would not expect. Let's sing about that God of grace right now. God of grace, amazing wonder, so immeasurable and free. minutes of quiet personal prayer to prepare our hearts for the preaching of the word.
Father, we praise you for everything that you are, for your grace, your mercy, for the amazing wonder, the immeasurableness of it, the beauty in it. But we thank you for being worthy. We know that nothing in this world can change your holiness, can change who you are, your character. Lord, I am so thankful for that. Having someone, Lord, constantly to go to and to rely on. Lord, even as us as First Baptists, Lord, we, we are blessed, Lord, to call you our Heavenly Father, and we thank you for it. Lord, as we are about to hear your word preached after this next song, Lord, I ask that our hearts would be engaged, our minds would be active, Lord, that Pastor Pete would, Lord, have strength as he preaches and focus in his mind. Lord, I pray that you be passionate about it and your word this morning. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Please join me in standing. We started singing this morning by crown him with many crowns, oh, for a thousand times to sing. His worthiness, we started singing about his grace, how he reached out, God reached out to even a man like Matthew, Levi, who we know as Matthew. And we recognize that we have nothing to offer when it comes to our relationship with Christ. We come to God as we are. And let's sing that truth right now. Just as I am, we come to our Heavenly Father.
this time our kids are dismissed go down to their class excellent singing i am i don't know about you but i am very thankful that we can come to god as we are uh, we don't have to uh, get everything perfectly situated before god will allow us to come to him so i am thankful for that take your bibles and turn to uh, luke chapter 6 Luke chapter 6 is where we'll be this morning. Just a quick announcement, um, deacons, I need to see you after the service just for a um, brief meeting. So deacons, just come to my office after the service and we will be brief. Just one item we need to go over. Luke chapter 6 is our text for this morning and I'm going to go ahead and read the entire text. It is verses 1 through 11 before we begin. On the Sabbath, while he was going through the grain fields, his disciples plucked and ate some heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands. But some of the Pharisees said, why are you doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? Jesus answered them, have you not read what David did when he was hungry? He and those who were with him, how he entered the house of the Lord and took and ate of the bread of the presence, which was not lawful for any but the priest to eat and also gave it to those with him and he said to them the son of man is the lord of the sabbath on another sabbath he entered the synagogue and was teaching and a man was there with whose right hand was withered and the scribes and the pharisees watched him to see whether he would heal on the sabbath so they might find a reason to accuse him but he knew their thoughts, and he said to the man with a withered hand, Come and stand here. And he rose and stood there. And Jesus said to them, I ask you, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or destroy it? And after looking at them all, he said to him, Stretch out your hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored. But they were filled with fury and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. Let's pray. God, I, will, I pray that you will be with us today. Lord, I pray that you will help us as we look at this text. This is your word. This is the gospel that you have given to us. Lord, it's something that was written by man, yet it was ordained by you. So, Lord, I pray that you help us to understand this, this text Lord, I pray you help it to uh, be something that we apply to our life. And we ask that you are glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to give you an a odd fact that you probably don't even care about. But I'm going to do it anyway, because it fits into my sermon. Does anyone know where, you know, and if you know this, you're one of those people who likes odd facts. Um, my son likes odd facts. Does anyone know where the largest fence in the world is found? Largest fence. Anyone? I, Doug knew, and I knew Doug would knew this, know this. The largest fence in the world is found in southern Australia. It is a pest control fence that was built in 1885. It was built to keep the, the dingoes out of the relatively fertile southeastern part of the continent. Actually, I have a map of the continent. The red, the red little squiggly line, that's the fence. It was used to protect the flocks, the sheep. It's called the dingo fence. It is six feet high, and it was built, uh, it's buried a foot into the ground. 
It is 3,488 miles long. Now, just to give you a rough estimate, that is like from Seattle to Miami. That is a long fence. You say, why are you telling us this odd fact? Well, let me explain that. Our stories today, the two different stories we're looking at are about the Pharisees. We talked about the Pharisees last week. The Pharisees understood the value of a good fence. No, I'm not talking about a literal fence like we see here in Australia. I'm talking about a, a, a figurative fence. Let me explain what I mean. To stop people from breaking laws, the, God gave the people of Israel numerous laws. And to, to prevent people from breaking laws, what the Pharisees would do is they would create rules. Or basically they would establish fences so you couldn't even get close to the law. Let me give you an example of what that would be like, just for us, so you can understand. Suppose God had a law that no one was allowed to stand at this pulpit, right here, except for the pastors of this church. Okay? By the way, that's not a rule. That's not a law of God. I'm just using this as an illustration. So God establishes a law that no one could stand at this pulpit unless you were a pastor of First Baptist Church. So Pastor Will and I are the only ones allowed to stand here. But Pastor Will and I discuss and we realize that it might be tempting for some of you to come up and stand here. Oh, not during a service, but maybe another time you come up and stand here. And so in order to prevent you from standing here, what we decided was we're going to do whatever we can to establish a perimeter so you wouldn't even come up here. And so we create a rule. It's not the law of God. We create the rule of Will and Pete. We'll call it that. And the rule of Will and Pete, to make it so you don't come up here, the rule of Will and Pete is that you're not even allowed to step foot on the stage or even the stairs. So we create a law, a rule, that if you even step right here, you have broken our rule. Okay, it's the rule of Will and Pete. Okay, this was something the Pharisees would do. And so what would happen is, is that if you would step on that imaginary line, you have now broken the law. Uh, the problem is, is that what they did was often was they raised their rules to the level of God's law. So that would be like me doing the same thing that some day after the, after the service, someone's walking by the front and there, there's a crowd of people gathered here. And so in order to avoid the crowd of the people, they step up onto that bottom step. Guess what they just did? They broke Will and Pete's law. They're in trouble. You say, well, that's kind of ludicrous, but I, I've actually seen this in Christian ministries. Not, not, you know, that. I remember a Christian uh, school that I was a part of where they, they wanted to teach young ladies to dress in a modest way. Now, modesty is, is uh, God, part of God's law, right? Um, God teaches modesty in the Bible. We see that. And so modesty is a good thing to teach. But in order to regulate it, this school made a rule that girls' skirts or shorts had to go to the bottom of their knee. Okay? Any of you ever been to a place that had a rule like that? Okay? Here's the thing. Institutions can establish rules, and that's perfectly fine. I, I always said this when I was in schools that had rules. It would be like, it's just a rule. It's not, it, it's not a, a big deal. I will follow the rule because I'm in the institution. Many of you work at places that have rules the same way. You have, your, your employees have rules. So having a rule as an institution is not a bad thing. But the problem is sometimes if we're not careful, what happens, in, especially in Christian, Christian institutions, is those type of rules become raised up to a level of God's law. And I saw this at times in an institution where this was the case. So if a woman was to come walking in and her skirt was, you know, this far above her knee, she had broken God's law. That's not true. And the problem is, is that if we're not careful, we can do the same thing. Oh, yeah, you know, this is a rule that we establish. It's not the same thing as God's Law And what the Pharisees were doing was, is they were, they were uh, messing with God's law and equating it. And so one of the most guarded areas in God's law for the Pharisees was the command that we see to keep the Sabbath day holy. 
So in an effort to keep this law, the Pharisees, what they made, did was they made dozens and dozens and dozens of rules to protect so that you wouldn't actually, you know, step onto the bottom step. And so they made some really crazy rules on the Sabbath. You know, there was a rule on the Sabbath that you were not allowed to light a fire in your home because that was work. There was a rule that, and I kid you not, there was a rule the Pharisees had that if you, uh, you could not drag a chair across your house. Why? Because the w floors were, uh, were, were dirt, and so when you drag a chair across the floor, it might make grooves, and then you would have to smooth those out, and that would be work. I mean, it seems ludicrous, doesn't it? Well, that's what they would do. Now, the laws of God concerning the Sabbath were not ludicrous. We see those in Exodus chapter 20. And here's uh, from the Ten Commandments where God gave them the, the law of the Sabbath. And in there he says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But on the seventh day, it is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in the six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. God established the Sabbath. Now this word Sabbath is a Hebrew word that means to rest or to desist from doing work. It was made, as we see here, it was, it was established to commemorate the seventh day as a day of rest after God created earth on six days. We see this in Genesis. In Genesis it says, and on the seventh day God finished his work that he had done and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. Sabbath was something God established. For the Jews, the Sabbath would start at 6 p.m. on Friday, and it would go until 6 p.m. on Saturday. And so during that time, they were careful not to, uh, to do anything that was against the Sabbath. I want to stop here for a moment, just kind of... This is kind of a parenthesis thought, but I, I don't want to, I want to be careful that we don't confuse the importance of the Lord's Day... On Sunday, the first day of the week, which we recognize today, from the last day of the week, which was the Sabbath. Okay? They're not the same thing. And Scripture does not call them the same thing. Uh, one writer said it this way, The Sabbath is, is the reminder of the completion of the original creation, while the Lord's Day is a reminder of the completion of the Lord's work on the cross in the new creation. I think that's a good way to put it. The Sabbath speaks of rest after work and relates to the law, while the Lord's Day, Sunday, speaks of rest before the work and relates to grace. So we understand. I'm not talking, when I talk about the Sabbath, I'm not talking about Sunday. Um, I, I don't think that uh, Scripture makes the connection between those two. The Sabbath was something in the Old Testament, and we'll talk about that briefly. But the Sabbath was a, was a holy day set aside by God, and the purpose was for worship, for rest, for refreshment. But what the Pharisees did was they took what God intended, and, and they made it into something even more. And so what they meant and thought was that if it, you were not to work at all, you were not to do anything, uh, and, and basically that was the idea of the Sabbath, and they took it to extremes, uh, they, they, like making the stage off limits. That, they took it to extremes. In fact, they had a list of 39 different kinds of work that were illegal on the Sabbath. Is that seen in God's law? No, it wasn't. But they took God's law and they took it to, in a sense, to another level. Now, the Pharisees, what they did was they claimed that they were the custodians of the, the traditions of Moses. And so, therefore, they believed that they had the right to legislate what the people did and didn't do on the Sabbath. So here's the problem is what, what, be, what we see here is that the, the Pharisees, they became self-righteous. 
And I think what self-righteousness does, and I've seen this, you know, even in our world today, what self-righteousness does is it blinds us to the true inner demands of God's moral standards. You know, we can be so concerned with conforming to some legalistic standards of do's and don'ts that we miss the, the heart and the compassion that God has in, in the law that he established. And so instead of love, mercy, and compassion, and justice, we pride ourselves on some lesser code of conduct. Well, I have did this instead of seeing what was God's purpose. Why, why did God establish the Sabbath? For his glory. But I think what the Pharisees had done is they had completely forgotten the purpose. And so because of that, the glory of God was forgotten. And so the Sabbath day became just a list of prohibitions, which many of them were laughable. So I say all that. This is all introduction into our passage for today. And in our passage today, we see two different stories about the Sabbath. And we want to talk about these because I think we want to understand the problem that the Pharisees had and how Jesus confronted it. And so this, this, these, these disagreements came about and they really created controversies. So what I want to look at is I want to look at two Sabbath controversies that we see in this passage and, and what we should think about them. First one is the, the dealing with hunger. We see in this passage that there is some fundamental issues that we want to deal with. And, and so I have some statements that I want to make here. First of all, there was a fundamental human need, and that was they were hungry. Look at verse 1 of chapter 6 again. On the Sabbath, while he, that is Jesus and his disciples, they're going through a grain field. His disciples plucked, ate some of the heads of the grain, and rubbed them in their hands. You say, okay. What's the issue here? Now, I want to stop before I get into exactly the details. And I, I want you to see that uh, there's some, you got to read through the text a little bit here. So the disciples are walking through a grain field. And the Pharisees observe this. Now, understand this. Pharisees were not people who went out into the grain field. So how did they see this? They were spying on Jesus. Okay? They're, they are waiting for Jesus to make a mistake. That's, that's exactly what they're doing here. And so they, it's, it's like they're walking around following Jesus, waiting for him to step on the bottom step. They're, they're waiting for it to happen. And, and, uh, and, and so we come here and we see that Jesus is walking through the field. Now, uh, Luke doesn't tell us this, but in Matthew's account of this story, Matthew tells us, I think something that Luke kind of implies, but Matthew tells us that the disciples, they're hungry. You got to remember that these, these men had left, many of them had left their jobs. We talked about Matthew. We talked about Peter. Had left their jobs and were following Jesus. And so they, they, they were following Jesus around. And so they didn't have, you know, they didn't have, uh, you know, a wallet full of money that they could pull into the fast food joint and get lunch. They were tired. They were hungry. And so they did something here that was a normal, common thing in that day. In fact, what they did was not illegal. You might be thinking, well, are they stealing? Was this their grain field? No. Uh, there is exceptions in the law where the Bible talks about where a sojourner traveling through the land was allowed to pick what he could eat. And so what they were doing was not wrong. It was not illegal. It was something that was acceptable to do. So what was, what was the problem here? And the problem was, is the, the difference, and this leads to my second statement, there was a fundamental difference in, in perspective. The, the uh, Pharisees had a very legalistic perspective. They said, hey, you know what? You can't step on the bottom step. Their, their rule was about work. And so what was their main complaint? They were finding fault in the action of the disciples of Jesus. As I said earlier, there are 39 different kinds of work that the Pharisees listed in the law of the Pharisees that were uh, illegal to do on the Sabbath. Now, according to these rules, the disciples, I want you to understand, the disciples were breaking three of them. 
You say, what do you mean? Notice what it says in the text. It says, while they were going through the field, the disciples plucked. Okay, that's the first one. That was the act of reaping. They plucked. I mean, think about this for a second. We don't often walk through grain fields, so maybe this is a hard one for us to understand. But let's, let's say you're walking through the field and there's, you know, uh, uh, a strawberry patch. And you reach down and you grab a strawberry. Okay, I, I wouldn't necessarily call that reaping, right? I mean, you're picking a piece of fruit. That's essentially what's happening here. But not only that, they were threshing. What is the process of threshing? The process of threshing was they would take all the grain that was, was reaped that day and they would take it to the threshing floor. And on the threshing floor, they would, they, they would, they would pound it. And what it would happen was, is by doing this, they would separate the, the chaff from the actual grain. They would separate that which was not necessary, the husk and all that, from the natural, actual grain. It says in the passage, his disciples plucked it, and so they would do that. And then they, it says, look, they ate some of the heads, they rubbed it in their hands. And what they were doing was that, was they were threshing it. And then, it, uh, and then it, another law that they would have broken was they would winnow. You say, what is winnowing? Winnowing is basically, then they would have, after they uh, threshed it, they would have the, a, a pile of of the good stuff and they would have a pile of the stuff that was just trash and they would take that and they would just kind of put it to the side. Now, that was the process of winnowing. So basically the issue here is this Pharisees are stepping up. Their big issue is you worked. Did they? Obviously not. But the problem was is that the, the, they were so concerned, they were con so concerned about, about stepping on the bottom step in our earlier story that they missed the issue. They missed the issue of there was a need and they didn't see the compassion. And I think sometimes it's, it's easy to do the same thing. It's easy to judge others based on a rule or at least a perceived rule without seeing the heart behind the rule. So how does Jesus respond? Look at verse 2. We see there the Pharisees is where they're complaining. Why are they doing what is not lawful to do on Sabbath? And Jesus answers them, have you not read what David did when he was hungry? He and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and they took and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any, but the priest to eat and gave it to those uh, with him. What Jesus does is he illustrates, he illustrates why the Pharisees are being um, overly concerned with rules by telling a story. And he takes them back to the Old Testament. This is found in, in 1 Samuel chapter 21. We're not going to turn there. You can read it later. But he takes them back and he illustrates their lack of compassion and their unnecessary clinging to uh, the law by recalling a story that, that, uh, about David that they would have known very well. They're Pharisees. They knew the Old Testament. They would have known this story. Now what's this story about? So in this story, David is not yet king. David is, has been, uh, he, he has been anointed as going to be king, but he has not yet been king because King Saul is still alive. And King Saul is pursuing David and his men. I mean, everywhere, everywhere they go, da uh, King Saul is pursuing them. Because why? Because King Saul at this point wants to kill David. And so David is, and his men are running. I mean, they're just constantly, they're, they're fugitives, basically. And they're running, and, and, and they're, they're desperate, and they're hungry. And so in the process of that, they come to the house of God. And they walk in the house of God, and David comes in to the priest, a man by the name of Abimelech. And he says to Abimelech, he says, we are hungry. Do you have any bread? Now, in the house of God, there would have been bread maybe set aside for people to eat when they came in. And so the priest goes over, and it would be called common bread. And the priest goes over, and he looks into the supply, and he says, David, I'm sorry, but the, the common bread's all gone. There's none available. And David says, okay, but what about the bread of the presence? You say, what's that? Now, oftentimes it's called the show bread. In the house of God, they would t there was a, a gold table. And every Sabbath, the priests would come and they would place 12 
uh, loaves of, not bread that we think of, this was unleavened bread, but they would take 12 loaves of bread and they would put it there on the gold, golden table. And what it was, was when the, when the people would come into the house of God to, to, to worship God on the Sabbath, they would see these and it was a reminder to the people of how God provided for them and God gave them provisions on a continual basis. And so it was, the bread was there and, and it was holy. Meaning that, as it says in the passage here, no one was allowed to eat this bread except for the priests. And they could, the priests could only eat it after it sat on the, on, the, on the gold table for a week. And then the priests could take it home and eat it. So, David comes in, and they're hungry, and they're desperate, and, and the priest says, all, all we have available is the showbread, and, and David says, can we please have the showbread? We're We're starving. And in a point of compassion, the priest says, yeah, you can have it. Now, here's the thing. When Jesus tells a story, immediately the Pharisees know. They won't admit it, but they know they're in trouble. Because they would have not have condemned the actions of David here. I mean, David was the hero king. And so the Pharisees, that's why we don't see them respond, because they had nothing to say. And basically what, what, what Jesus is saying in this moment is something, he's saying there's, there's, there, human need must not be subjected to cold, hard laws. I mean, this made their argument very difficult. It, it, it reminds me of a passage in Hosea where, where it says this, talking about where God is speaking. And he says, I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice. The knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. What God is saying in this passage is, I don't just want your ritual. I want your heart. I don't just want your performance. I want your love. The problem for the Pharisees is that they had given up on that. They were all about looking good. And their heart for people, their compassion was, had disappeared. Now look at verse 5. Jesus says something that must really have upset the Pharisees next. In verse 5, after, after he tells the story and Jesus says to them, The Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. Now we've already talked about this earlier in Luke where, where Jesus describes himself as the Son of, of Man. And so they knew what he was talking about here. And he, he says, The Son of Man. What Jesus is doing in this passage by saying this, he's saying, I am the Son of Man. And he's saying that I uh, am the Lord of the Sabbath. In other words, he's saying, I rule the Sabbath. Now, he can only rule the Sabbath In fact, if, in fact, he owns the Sabbath, and he can only own the Sabbath if, if, in fact, he's the one who made the Sabbath. So, by stating this, he is saying, I created it. I'm not a servant to it. Now, I want to pause there for a moment because I don't believe what he is saying here is, is that I am superior to the Sabbath and so I can do whatever I please. No, Jesus was still under the law. At this point, Jesus was still under the law, and that included the ceremonial law, that included the law of the Sabbath, but what Jesus is saying is uh, he's, his, his violation here was not uh, a contradiction to God's law, it was a contradiction to the man-made pharisaical res, uh, regulations. Now, there is going to come a time in the story in Luke where Jesus will fulfill the law by dying on the cross. And by doing that, eliminating the power of the law over the people. But that time hasn't come yet in this story. And so we see this controversy. Number one was dealing with hunger. Secondly, I want to notice the second one. The second controversy is dealing with disability. Again, there's some 
fundamental statements that I want to make. There was a fundamental human need, just like the last one, and we're going to talk about this in a minute, but before we do that, I want to point out a couple things. First of all, I want to remind you of something. I want to remind you that uh, when Luke wrote this gospel, he did, told us the very beginning of Luke why he wrote it. He wrote it so that we may know that Jesus is who he says he is. And so because of that, Luke doesn't necessarily always put things in perfect chronologic order like some of the other Gospels do. And so when we see here in verse 6, it says, on another Sabbath, and we know this is a different Sabbath, but we can't make the conclusion that this is the next week. In fact, this may have been some period later. But I think what Luke does is he puts these two together to see that this, this, this related idea of them battling over the Sabbath. Now, on this particular Sabbath, as he did many times, Jesus is in the synagogue. He's teaching. And it tells us there, he comes across, look at verse 6, and he enters the synagogue and was teaching. And a man was there whose right hand was withered. What does that mean? That word withered means dried up. In other words, it's to say that his right hand had no life in it. It was useless. I'm guessing at some point, some of you have met someone who have this type of thing. Maybe it's from cerebral palsy. Maybe it's from some other disease where their hand is withered. And I imagine it's kind of, you know, they kind of walk around and their hands like this and there's no life to it. You, you know what I mean? There's people that you've seen like that where they can't do anything with this hand. It's, it's just there. And that was this man. And for whatever reason, his right hand did not work. Now, you, you know people like this, and maybe, maybe uh, they continue through life and they, they succeed in life. But in, in this time period, this was a big deal when manual labor was the normal means of earning a living. So for a guy like this, he couldn't go out and work as a carpenter with this withered hand. He couldn't go out and work in the field. He couldn't be a fisherman. He couldn't uh, have cattle. He couldn't, he couldn't do any of that. So he had a need. And just in the last story, the, the, the disciples had a need. They were hungry, but this, one is, this one's a step up. I mean, this guy, this is his entire life. It's not just he's hungry in the moment. He has this big need. But like the last one, there's also a fundamental difference in perspective. Legalism versus compassion. Look at verse 7. And the scribes and the Pharisees watched him. To see whether he would heal on the Sabbath so they might find a reason to accuse him. Notice again, last time I said, I believe that the Pharisees had to be following Jesus through the field to catch them doing this. This time, they're watching Jesus to see what he would do. I, I read some commentators that actually believe that maybe, maybe the Pharisees even planted this man in the, in the midst of the people. I mean, it's possible doesn't say that. We'd have to read in the text. It's speculation. But knowing the Pharisees' vindictive nature, it's not beyond reason. I want to point out something that's interesting in this. You know what this tells us? The Pharisees actually believed that Jesus could heal. I don't think that there's ever a time when the Pharisees actually doubted Jesus' power. Because here they are, they're saying, notice that again, verse 7. They watched him to see whether he would heal. So they could accuse him. I mean, that, that's, that's amazing. These self-appointed guardians of the Sabbath system did not want to stop Jesus from healing. They actually wanted Jesus to heal so that they could then uh, indict him for a crime. And so Jesus actually performing a healing would best suit their heinous hatred that they had for Christ. Now, Jesus knew their thoughts. Look at verse 8. They didn't say anything. They didn't uh, uh, tell anyone. But verse 8, but he knew their thoughts. 
Now, that's an interesting word there because that word thoughts there is literally he knew their reasonings. He knew their, uh, their methods. He knew their schemes. He knew their plans. And so Jesus knew what they were trying to accomplish. Now, he could have said, okay, they're trying to get me. I'm just going to let this one slide today. But they were trying to lay a trap for Jesus. But little did they know that these religious trappers were the ones that would actually be trapped. And so we see again, instead of seeing having compassion on this man, they didn't care about this man. I mean, you realize that? I mean, these were the guys that were the religious leaders. They were the ones that the people in, in Jerusalem looked up to as the godly men, the righteous men, the holy men, the ones that were to be admired. And here they are. They're parading a, a man with a disability out uh, to try to get Jesus. They had no compassion. We see, thirdly, though, a third statement. There was a fundamental principle. And in this, we see Jesus always put the priority of others. Look at verse 8. He knew their thoughts, and he said to the man with a withered hand, Come and stand here. And he rose, and he stood there. Get the scene here. I don't know where this man is. Maybe he's kind of hiding in the crowd. Maybe he's sitting up front. I don't know. But Jesus looks at the man with the, with the withered hand and he says, he says, come on up here and stand in the middle. And the man walks up. If you, remember, if you remember, we talked about a few weeks ago what it would look like in this setting. In this setting, what it would be is most of them would be sitting on the floor and Jesus would be in a chair or something. So he would be above them while he taught. And this withered man comes up and he stands next to him. Now he's, he's front and center. And then he points and he, before he addresses the man with the withered hand, look what it says. He looks at the Pharisees. And he says to the Pharisees, I ask you, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm? To save life or to destroy it? And he places a challenge in front of the Pharisees. And I think their challenge here is, is, is threefold. First of all, it revealed that their extra biblical laws were actually unbiblical. Because God commands to do good. Second of all, it would have exposed that they actually could care less about the pain of others. They didn't care about that man. And thirdly, I think it would have shown to all that their plot was to take Jesus down. Jesus, on the other hand, cared about people. I mean, there are too many times to even count when we see Jesus reach down and show love and concern, not just for the elite, not just for the rich, not just for the uh, religious, but for the unlovable. And Jesus cared, and he always cared. His priority was on others. Third statement that I want to make here is there's a fundamental difference in behavior. Healing versus hatred. Continue reading, look at verse 9 again. And Jesus said to them, I ask you, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to harm, to save life or destroy it? Of course, there's no answer, right? I mean, they, they all know the answer. I mean, they, they would be foolish to respond here. They can't respond here. And then look at verse 10. And after looking around at them all, he said to him, stretch out your hand. And he did so, and his hand was, restored, was restored. Can you imagine this moment again? Pharisees all piously sitting around, and Jesus looks at them and says, Hey, let me ask you a question. On the Sabbath, is it, is it better to do good or do evil? And then notice what the passage says. I think he did one of those things that all of us that probably had happened when we were kids and our parents would do. Or maybe some of you, your spouse has done this to you. They asked a question and then they just stared into his eyes. I'm sure they were like, they, they were probably melting in their seat. It must have felt that way. 
And he asked them a question which need not be answered. And then he looked deep into their souls. And then Jesus stops and he turns and he looks at the man with that withered hand. And he says to him, stretch out your hand. Now, this is interesting. And why is this interesting? Because in the study of Luke, we've already seen numerous miracles that Jesus did where he healed someone. In every single case up to this point, Jesus healed someone. He reached out and touched them. Do you remember the leper? Remember when the leper came in and the Bible tells us that Jesus reached out and touched the hand of the leper, which was a no-no. Do you remember that when Jesus was in Capernaum and it says that he healed uh, Peter's mother-in-law and then the word got spread about who Jesus was and it tells us the entire town of Capernaum came and Jesus healed every one of them. And it tells us an interesting thing. It says he touched every single one of them. But in this story, it doesn't say that. It says Jesus looked at the man And he says, stretch out your hand. I mean, the interesting point is that the the man's issue was that it was likely preventing him from doing what God is asking. And so here's his hand and and, and he can't move. And the command at first, I mean, the command to stretch out your hand actually seems unreasonable and actually maybe even seems insulting. Because, because this man's obedience wasn't even possible. But the poor sufferer did not, was not stopped by doubts or reason of any kind. And because we, we see at once, what does he do? And I don't know if it was instantaneous. I don't know if it slowly happened. I don't know if he has his hand here and it's just suddenly he just starts slowly moving it. And all the crowd is watching. They know this man. And suddenly his hand is whole. And this precise act of obedience was what made him restored. You know what's interesting about this? What were the Pharisees trying to get Jesus to do? They were trying to get Jesus to heal because healing was one of those 39 forbidden acts of work. And you know what's the amazing part about this? Jesus didn't even lift a finger. Kind of hard to get him on work in there, isn't it? Notice the Pharisees' response. And this is amazing to me. Verse 11. But they were filled with fury. I mean, Jesus just uh, healed a man of an ailment. We don't know how long he had it, but Jesus just healed a man of a disability that now dramatically can change his life. Again, the Pharisees don't care about that. (laughs) They're angry. In fact, it goes even a step beyond that. It says fury or rage. and, And this word, the word here means someone who is wild. And without understanding. And you add in the idea that is, it says that they were filled with rage. And we give the idea here that the Pharisees, they're completely beside themselves. I mean, I think back to when I was a kid. And I remember the old time cartoons and you'd watch. And, and in the old time cartoons, when, when someone would uh, do something wrong and someone else would get angry, what would happen? Remember that? Like suddenly there would be like steam coming out of their ears and and their their face would get all red. And and, and if they get really mad, what would then eventually happen? Their head would explode, right? I mean, that's the image. I'm not trying to make fun, but that's the image I see here of the Pharisees is they're just sitting there and they're just like, (sighs) and they're just seething because Jesus healed a man. I mean, isn't that just ridiculous? Jesus made a man whole. I mean, it sounds nuts. But they were more concerned with Jesus' perceived infraction of the law than they were rejoicing over a man's body being healed. Okay. So we look at these two texts. And we have to ask ourselves, 
What, what does this mean to us? How, how, do we, how do we take this and apply it to our lives today? Because we don't have the, the Sabbath laws uh, the way that they did. Because Jesus eliminated the Sabbath laws on the cross. And so, I mean, we know that because the Bible tells us that Jesus, when, when he died, that the, the, the veil of the temple ripped in half. Meaning, worship's not the same. And so the Sabbath laws are not, uh, are not binding on us. And so what does this mean to us today? Well, two things. First of all, I don't want to run too quickly over the faith of this man with the withered hand. I mean, put yourself in his place. If you have any sort of physical handicap, the last thing that you want is for someone to call attention to it in a public setting. I mean, perhaps this man with the withered hand, when he, had, when he walked into the temple, maybe he, maybe he kept it tucked under his robe. He was embarrassed. And Jesus looks at him and says, rise and stand and come front and center where everyone can see your problem. I mean, how embarrassing. But he did it. In faith, he stepped up, he walked up, and he, and he did what God, what Jesus told him to do, even though there was embarrassment involved. And, and that is an incredible uh, act to the faith. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you have faith to act on your belief? You know, because God asks you to do things every day. Do you have enough faith to act on it? Do you have enough faith to act on, you know, when God tells you to love others? Do you have enough faith to act on when God tells you to not uh, lose your temper? Do you have enough faith to act on when God tells you to give? Do you have enough faith to act on when God tells you to serve in a way that seems a little difficult? This man here had enough faith to stand up, to walk front and center. And when Jesus said, hey, stretch out your hand, he didn't go, I can't do that. He did it. Second thing that I want to say in application is let's not let the law and our rules overcome our love and concern for the need of others. We will not agree with how everyone does life. But what Jesus teaches over and over and over again is grace and compassion should be over rules. I mean, do not get me wrong. Listen, I'm not, I'm not saying that we, we as humans, are. it's okay if we just throw aside all restraints. I'm not saying that. But we should not allow our adherence to the law to be akin to righteousness. And there are Christians today that that, man, I I look this certain way because I'm righteous. No, you look that certain way because you choose to look that certain way. Righteousness is what's in here. On the other hand, they'll look at someone over here and man, they don't look exactly like them. They don't dress the same. Their hair might be a little off. I mean, they have a few tattoos. There must be a problem there. And we make judgment. Instead of being like Jesus and looking with a heart of compassion. So how do we respond? Let's show compassion. Again, that does not mean that we don't have rules and laws. Those are necessity. Without rules and laws, there's chaos. But rules and laws should not trump love and compassion. Let's allow God to deal with the judging of the rules and laws. And let's show compassion to others. Let's pray. God, we are grateful for your word. We're grateful for how it uh, pierces our hearts and our souls. And Lord, um, I know that when I even think about this story of this man with the withered hand, just the, the, the faith that he had and the faith that required action, and, and yet he acted on it. 
Um, Lord, it wasn't as simple as some of Jesus' other miracles where Jesus reached out and touched someone. It, was, it, took, it took a step of faith. Lord, I pray that you help us to have faith to deal with our circumstances each and every day. Whatever circumstances you place us in, Lord, you call us to act uh, a way that pleases you and to bring honor and glory to your name. And when we get into those different circumstances, I pray that you have us, help, help us to have the faith to follow through with those. Maybe that's the faith to, to fight temptation. Maybe it's a faith to, to share the word with our neighbors, our friends. Lord, I pray that you'll help us not to be so caught up in rules and regulations that we miss the heart of the matter. Your glory. Lord, that we will, like your son, show compassion. Lord, that we will be people who uh, express love. Lord, we thank you for all you do, and I pray that you'll continue to work in our hearts and our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Pastor Will. Please join me in standing. We are able to show love because of the love we have been shown. Amen? Amen. Due to the greatness of our God. Let's sing together. A song we just learned a couple weeks ago as we close out our service, How Great. I'll bless your name, O oh God.
worship you this morning. Lord, your word is a lamp to our feet. Let it be a light, or light to our path this week. We thank you that we can live in your light, walk in your truth. Lord, may the things that you reveal, the thoughts that we have shared this morning, Lord, dwell in our hearts, and that they would stir us to action this week. We ask all this in the precious name of Christ. Amen. You may be seated. We'll have a short announcement video, and then you'll be dismissed immediately afterwards. Hey, First Baptist family. Glad you could join us in worship this morning. Three announcements, and I'll let you go. First of all, Tuesday evening at 6 p.m., Sow and Reap is going to be meeting right here in the church building. So if you're a part of Sow and Reap, make sure to remember this Tuesday evening, 6 p.m., also, we are continuously doing our outreach of Impact Basketball. Now, this is a ministry for boys 7th through 12th grade. Any boys 7th through 12th grade is able to come to the church building every Tuesday. This is for boys that are a part of our church, as well as any boy that's outside of our church in the community. Everyone's welcome to come from 4 to 6 p.m. We get together, we play basketball, we have a Bible talk. Very basic, very simple. We get together, we talk about God's Word. We play some ball. Have a good time. It's a lot of fun. Last announcement. Man camp. The 23rd, the 24th, this Friday and Saturday. It's going to be a lot of fun. Any male in the church of any age is welcome to come. We're going to be meeting at Potato Creek State Park. Make sure you let me know if you're coming. Even if you're just going to come Friday night for dinner and hang around around the fire, you're more than welcome to do so. But I need to know if you're coming so I know how much food to buy. All right? So, it's going to be a lot of fun. If you're interested in staying overnight, we do stay on the campsite overnight. We have breakfast there in the morning. It's a great time of fellowship. I hope you're able to join us. If this is your first time here joining us at First Baptist Church, thanks for choosing to worship with us. Make sure you stop by our guest center in the annex. There we have a gift mug set out just for you. First Baptist family, have an awesome week.